Today, we have the team from FIO for your eyes only, a cybersecurity firm marrying AI, Web3, decentralization. Uh, we have Brian Gale and we have Thomas Olofsson. Brian Gale is the co-CEO. Thomas Olofsson is, of course, CTO. Guys, welcome, for, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So... Just jumping in, uh, you know, this is such an extraordinary time. We're seeing all this insane acceleration, at least in terms of mass adoption of AI. Uh, you know, we've been seeing Web3 growing for so many years. Uh, maybe if you guys can, just both of you, give me a sense of your background, how you came to join FIO, and for people not familiar, what the company's all about. Maybe we'll just start with Brian. Sure. So my background... Um... Ironically, it's nothing to do with cybersecurity. Uh, I have about 20 years in marketing, advertising, helping startups launch and uh, bringing new innovative technologies to market. So um, I, I like to say I've worked among all the buzzwords over the years from, you know, from gaming to 3D printing to VR and AR and then eventually Web3 and cryptocurrency. So I've really covered all the different hype cycles over the last two decades. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it seems like you've had a little of everything. And then, uh, Thomas, yourself? Yeah, it's funny. When I met Brian, it's like my background is pure cryptography uh, and pre, pre Web 3 and, and crypto. So I'm so old that crypto to me actually means cryptography and not cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, so, so my background was, was really on that. And I worked with both like military applied encryption and civilian encryption and actually pen testing and breaking encryption for a very long time. So the, and, and that's how I got into the, the blockchain space because no one was no knew anything about encryption. And it's like, well, that's sort of, you should know about encryption if you're trying to build cryptocurrencies. So, so we, we sort of found the niche there. <laughs> no, it's super interesting. And it's interesting your backgrounds too. I do find it seems people in cybersecurity, and maybe that's a necessary element, it's always a really unusual grouping of people I've always noticed, right? Like it's never the same type. Like you are saying, Brian, you don't even really have a conventional cybersecurity background. Thomas, you've been working in crypto for so long. And then worth noting, you guys are in completely different locations, right? You're off in Denver. Yeah. And then uh, Thomas, you're out in Sweden, right? Yeah, uh, I'm based in Sweden uh, and I actually met Brian b because they had pitched a, a Web3 project and then applying blockchain uh, in a new way to, to a, a Fortune 100 client in the US. And it's like, hey, we need someone to help with the implementation to make sure this is actually encrypted and secure. And then I was at, met through David. We were both advising another uh, Web3 startups who we were both advisors to another company and met that way of, and, and sort of started working together in like securing blockchain and, yeah. and applying blockchain. I think the the fact that we have so much diverse backgrounds, like I bring in very much a consumer focused background, understanding a lot of like user experience and how people interact with products and new technologies. And Thomas with his technical, I think it's really helped in the innovation of our products to bring a very human element and something that's very intuitive. No, and I noticed that in your branding as well, that it's not, it's very, very sophisticated, but it seems accessible, which I think is so vital. Um, <clears throat> You know, particularly in the blockchain space, this is one that can get very, very confusing. And then with AI on top, of that gets even more confusing. But uh, maybe if, I think a great place to start, because I, I, you know, when when you go to FIO, go FIO dot com, uh, it's a lot of services, it's a lot of things that they could, you know, for someone completely unaware of what and how to protect themselves. Uh, what makes FIO unique, and can you kind of elaborate on some of those services? I think uh, Brian or Thomas, whoever whoever wants to start. Um, yeah, so I can start. I mean, historically, what we started out as uh, was basically an auditing service and making sure that the cryptography was done right in, in the blockchain space. But then we realized that, that my background from cybersecurity, like half of the money that was stolen or lost was through contract hacks or layer one hacks. The other half was through traditional like phishing, reused passwords, credentials, you know, the, the normal problems that everyone and their dog have with cybersecurity. We have too many passwords, we, we too few passwords, we use them everywhere, uh, we don't have strong encryption. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so basically, what what we ended up building was a suite of tools which we thought would be very useful for the Web three space, but also for the normal consumer, which is like check if your credentials have been breached to actually 
not only help people with like securing the blockchain elements, but also the whole project and the end users. Because again, most of the cybersecurity risk is is from misuse from end users. That's a great point. And Brian, any uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I like to from where we started. It was a logical step. We start with: Is there any logic errors? Is there any potential vulnerabilities in what you're building? So then you're like, okay, great, I have a secure project. Now, how do we protect our company and our users? And that's the next step, which is our automated threat intelligence. Where, as Thomas mentioned, we're able to do things like: Do you guys have leak credentials? Do you have new leaks? And uh, worth noting, as opposed to like have I been pawned, it's we're actually showing the plain text passwords that were leaked and. As many people might wonder, what is the top leak password today? It is still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> that is the number one password leaked in our database of over 25 billion credentials. Wow. So we're protecting, now we're going to that next step of protecting the organization. So then how do we get to the end user for the millions of people that are interacting with web applications every day? Phishing remains one of the biggest problems. So we can talk about it a little bit later, but we have what we think is a very novel patented approach to stopping phishing, which is where our use of our own proprietary AI comes in. But overall, what makes us really unique, I think, is every one of our products. I like to say the summer intern could use them and implement them at the organization in under five minutes. That's a great point. And it does seem, it's interesting you were saying the one, two, three, four, five, like that. Like it is amazing to me, even now, even with things like the last past situation that we all had to witness, uh, you still have people who really don't understand like basic password 101 that you just want something that's at least somewhat difficult to guess but i guess that really still is a problem right well it's it's a timing issue uh in the sense that we are all multitasking at the office every day and we're going in we're creating an account with our work email for some external service say it's just like signing up for your doordash account your brain immediately goes to the most like recently used thing or a thing that makes the most sense that you know you've memorized and that's a password that you've been using the last 20 years the average person today still uses five or fewer passwords. So the problem is when you have services like Drizzly, where people are ordering, you know, office beers for a summer launch party, they're using that very simple password. But most of the time, you're also using that password internally. So when the Drizzly breach happened, that means all these business accounts that were people using reused passwords, that is a potential vulnerability internally at the organization. It, it's just simple that we like to take shortcuts as humans, and we go to the most easily accessible item. And Unfortunately, that means, you know, our passwords. <laughs> right. And I think I talk to people who do that variation too, right? It's like there's only one slight <laughs> switch on each one. It's like the website name and then it's the one, two, three, four, five. So the hackers will never figure that yeah, out. Or the website name or the year. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So but, like... what, but what you're providing is extraordinarily important though, because even things like two-step, uh, you know, uh, authentication is not really, if I'm right, it's not as secure as people think it is, right? SMS protection, that's not... As no, I, I mean, that's also one thing that, that we're working on. We're indexing not only leaked credentials, but also leaked phone numbers because the, the attackers are, are ahead of the game there. So they're, they're actually also, a lot of telcos have been hacked multiple times. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but some of the big uh, American carriers have been hacked multiple times. Uh, one that starts with a T uh, has been hacked three times. <laughs> so let's start with that one, and they have leaked all their phone, the, all the customers' phone numbers. And if we, so basically, what we've done in FIO is to take that we, we're calling it the data lake of credentials. We can map your username and your password to your email address. So we have around a billion telephone numbers, with, which we can also map to usernames and passwords. And that makes it very interesting for smishing attacks, where you can actually fish the 2FA codes. You can actually send fake text messages to these telephone numbers with fake 2FA codes, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we did a talk on that on Black Hat, and that's something that we're seeing a lot of people bypassing 2FA uh, via text messages. A lot of hackers are doing that, and, and it's a seven times increase in, in 2022 over 2021. Well, it, it really is a constant, like a data warfare, basically, right? Because you have hackers that are increasingly becoming more and more sophisticated. And it's not like you just provide a one-time service. You have to constantly be updating, constantly, yeah. you know, thinking. And not even that, but you almost have to be, ima like chess, you have to be imagining threats that are coming before they think of them, right? You have to think like a hacker, effectively. Yeah, yeah you, you need to be one, one step ahead of them. And, and, and the problem is, in general, 
that's not how it works because you only think of the problem when you have been breached. It's like, oh, okay, you could switch <laughs> oh, my have done phone that. number and do this. Oh, how did they do that? So, so a lot of the research that we have done and talked about is actually by looking at incidents, looking at some of these, like, okay, this this Web3 exchange or crypto exchange got hacked. How did they do it? And that's how we did our research. Okay, okay, they did this. They actually spoofed phone numbers. They, they found the phone numbers. This is what they did. And then we reproduced it. So that we know how to protect against it, because obviously no one is going to tell you how they got hacked. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And especially interesting what you just said, too, on the crypto side, because I think a lot of us assume crypto is always secure, but you're doing audits where you're finding, you know, vulnerabilities, you know, on major tokens, major protocols that people may have thought, oh, everything's airtight, it's crypto, therefore there's no way to breach that. But there are ways, right, that the human error continues to exist. Yeah, and I mean, the human is, if you have a good, a good audit, and even if you're reading your code, there's always the, the users that are using your your crypto and connecting via the web browser. And, and there's always the, the weakest link, which might be that someone has installed malware on your phone or, mm. or on your end computer. And it doesn't matter how good you are at encryption, you can never protect against that. If someone has full access to your machine, uh, why what we call rats, remote access trojans, etc., that then it's game over. They can empty your account. Yeah. And the, I would say the biggest difference between crypto and a lot of other industries is there's one, the fear of missing out. So phishing attacks are rampant because it's like, here's an airdrop for these tokens. It's going to explode. And, you know, you as a person, you're looking at how can I get rich quick? That's kind of a lot of what's happened in crypto over the years. You know, I mean, not I can't think of any stocks I've had that have had like 10,000% increases. So as a user, you're clicking really quick, you're putting in your email, you're connecting a wallet because you don't want to miss that airdrop that has, it's simple like e-commerce strategy, right? Three minutes left, don't miss out. It's, and users click and they're robbed from there, right? And the same goes for what's happening with impersonation attacks. So for instance, Ledger had a breach, but it was just none, none of the pertinent stuff, but it was email and phone number. So then you get robocallers because they say, well, if you have a ledger account, you probably have a Coinbase account. You know, your email, someone's trying to change it to Noah1234, and uh, we need you to verify this information because it, they could be trying to get into your Coinbase account. It was not from Coinbase, but they're able to correlate different pieces of information together because they're getting much more sophisticated in the way. And if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in crypto, like you, that initiates this panic, right? <laughs> wow. No, I, it's funny you say that because I've noticed that in my own family members, you know, obviously, you, you know, like not to tear into my mom, but, you know, my mom is not as com <laughs> computer savvy. And I tell her, you know, don't open any emails that are asking for passwords or anything like that. No matter how legit it looks, just give me a call. Let's talk it over. Let's figure out what to do next. Um, what you were talking about here, you know, mentioning some of the robocallers, this gets me thinking about something that's so profound. And, uh, and I know we've I don't know if you saw the headlines on CNN here, you know, you have this concept where people are now able to call more and more efficiently using AI and, and really streamline that, uh, that phishing concept. Um, what, uh, Brian, what are your thoughts on that? What, where do you see AI, both from the perspective of how FIO is using it to uh, defend and protect your users, but also uh, from a hacker standpoint, where people are are really deploying these technologies, and of course, I want to get Thomas's view on this as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Thomas talk to the technical and how we're using it. But it's like yeah. I've seen Arnold Schwarzenegger now in like a hundred different movies, and it's hysterical. And even on the Ellen Show, like you know where they're using him. But but now they're targeting SMBs, especially like the ones that don't have robust cybersecurity. They have the IT guy that sets up email and figures out what services. But they're entering a whole well, I guess all of us are entering a whole new world where you can get a phone call from your wife, but it's not really your wife. You know, that's way beyond the guy that would call like my grandparents and say, your grandson's in Las Vegas and uh, he got in an accident and he needs you to bail him out. Like that was the old way. The new way is it's actually coming from your grandson. And with how many of us are on recording videos on TikTok and Instagram and all these social media services that seems fun, those types of recordings can be leveraged to generate AI to mimic a person's voice and could really cause harm. And Matt, this podcast, you'd probably be an easy target there. That's what I was just saying. <laughs> like, I'm just like, here we go. Just uh, you know, it's Matt. Weird, if you though. call me later for fifty bucks, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's weird though. I, I, I'm always a little bit amazed that people. I mean, 
it's going to get better and better and better. But I'm always a little bit amazed when I've watched the news reports on it because the tech doesn't quite seem there yet. Like the person's voices always sound a little bit stilted, you know? I don't know if you if you guys know that too. Just, hello there. Oh. Yes, I'm doing great. It, it, like, oh, hey there. You know, it's just, I don't know. I, I, but I guess when if it's, you're- When it's old, live, yes. Yeah. And I suppose, I guess on a phone, you're not looking for a scammer. You're expecting maybe maybe they have a cold or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I wake up sometimes and sound that way too. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but, but it is a trend. We are seeing that the threat actors are employing AI, as is everyone. Other, other, I mean, you have, it is an arms race, uh, pretty much. And, and funny thing, I just followed F Secure Mikko Hyppinen, which is a like, big security uh, following as well. And he had just published the first that they detected malware and ransomware. That was written with AI, so they now have self-replicating AI to bypass the antivirus, Unreal. which are they're just asking like, "Hey, ChatGPT, can you rewrite this code? Because then the signatures won't work. So, can you write this code better? Could you improve this?" As we have now started to see malware and ransomware gangs that are actually using ChatGPT and other AI uh, generative AIs to actually improve their their malware code, and and we are soon going to see viruses that that toolkits and this is what we, what we think is going to happen next that there is going to be ai generative toolkits and trained models that's just trained to generate malware so we're going to have to jump in a little bit later on this podcast into some of the details on your tools but just at a kind of a high level what are you doing to combat that because this does like you said this is accelerating at such an unbelievable rate how are you keeping up how are you uh, able to anticipate or at least as quickly as possible um catch up to threats as they as they continue to come well well basically we, we're using an ai model which is not gpt but it's it, it's a bert based model uh, it's from google and it, but it's similar in in and for people not familiar sorry but what bert based model is what um, basically you can say it's the opposite of of what gpt is gpt takes something already encoded and generates text this actually translates text into a data model so so in there was an original paper called um, for for large language models which was called attention is everything and they basically described two things an encoder stage and a decoder stage and, and google took and built the bert model which is the encoder stage and, and the chat gpt has the chat interface so they didn't need to encode stuff so they just took the other part of the model and built the gpt model that produces text so for these so for detecting threats is much better to use the BERT model, which is like encoding it and finding patterns in, in the data that you input, whereas GPT is taking data and then generating an output. Um, so, so using these models, we have trained our own LLM model. LLM stands for large language models mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we have trained on subsets. So, so the good thing with these models is that they know a lot of stuff. Like they know that HTTPS is more secure than HTTP. It knows that a Russian server is probably worse than than a, you can ask it. Like, hey, which is higher risk, a Russian server or a Chinese server or a US server? It will, it will answer that. Yeah, it, it, it knows a lot of things because it's learned and it's read a lot of text. So we do and does it that. know which server it is or can people disguise that? No, and, and so, so we're actually feeding that, that to training data, like or, or for to detecting phishing sites. We're first training it on, on all the big sites. So we're saying this is the server, this is the IP address, this is the language that is written is, this is text on the page, this is how long it is. So we're feeding a lot of metadata to this model and we're training it on, on the, like, it's not Alexa, but, but they used to be like Alexa top million. So we're feeding it the first million sites that are biggest on the internet. And then we're feeding it uh, the, all the manually detected phishing sites that we detected. And then it learns to discern. It's like, so you can after a while say with 99.7% accurate, this is, this is a phishing site. We don't train it. We, we, we're not sure what it's looking for. We just feed it all the websites. It's, it's just a pre-trained model that, we, that we, we feed a lot of websites. So it learns how a normal website look. And then when we mark phishing sites, we feed them that tag that this we have manually verified is phishing. So, so, and we give it all the data and it you, just learns uh, as a self learning model to discern. That's stunning. That's stunning how it's able to do that in terms of, yeah, the back end. It's you, you feed it the information and we're getting to that point where we're not even fully aware of what it's doing, but we know that once we plant that in, that it's able to train on these. Uh, <clears throat> 
that's the thing with these like large models. They're so big, so no one really knows what's happening. If you try to visualize these models, not even the guys that invented the model knows how it works. It, it just it fires between basically you're simulating a brain and it's the firing between synapses basically. So there's a lot of stuff firing. No one knows really why, but but. <laughs> <laughs> That's so stunning. I mean, it's just an incredible moment in history. But you're right. I mean, the, you look at you know even the folks over at ChatGPT, and and there's there's just kind of that I don't know what's happening now. We're we're yeah. putting the information in. Um, but Brian, uh, just you know, following up on what Thomas was talking about, you know, this is insane uh, tech you have on your side, very sophisticated. Um, but I guess you also need to balance that with keeping it relatively easy from the consumer side, right? They, it, to them, it shouldn't Correct. feel complicated, right? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, when I started in, for instance, in blockchain eight years ago, I was like, you know, no, no normal person should be using the word blockchain on a day-to-day -day basis in the future if a true adoption takes place. And, you know, I, I really think about that with any emerging technology, that the whole background of the technology isn't the discussion piece, it's how it's being implemented to solve real world problems. So for instance, for FioAgent, which leverages our AI model, which we call Fisco AI, which Fisco stands for fish in Sweden. I probably pronounced it wrong, Thomas, but sorry. Um, but really it's, you create an account, email, password, log in, where we've integrated our breach credential database. So Matt, you can go in and you could see, you use an account you've had for a long time when you download it, and you'll see all the different leaks you've had for your email address. But then really it's just syncing in real time with our database of like consistently updating with what are new phishing sites. So as a user, you only really know that you're getting protected when you hit, when you click a link in Twitter, Telegram, it's link agnostic, meaning no matter where the link comes from, we're blocking in the browser. And it says, this is a suspected phishing site. This is a malware site. And it says it right on the screen and the user clicks, well, shouldn't click that, leave site. So from a user perspective, the whole onboarding experience we've made is down to as long as it takes for you to hit in your verification code, because we are showing very sensitive data for your email address where you have to verify ownership, but that's really it. You're only, you're getting this real time protection and there's really no interaction or behavior needed on your part, except when something, when you go to a bad place or a bad site. Thomas, anything, uh, anything else on that? Yeah, I mean, basically, and, and yeah, I want to add that we're actually releasing this uh, free for for non-commercial use for everyone, um, because we, we actually do want to protect everyone, because the phishing is a big threat. And also, the other reason for releasing it free is that the more users that we have, they can report phishing sites, and it becomes a crowdsourcing of, of like intelligence data to us. Um, and also, the, the more users we have, the more training data do we get for, for our uh, AI to become better at detecting phishing sites. But we don't actually track where you're browsing, if that makes sense. The model will only say, like, okay, now you reach a site that we know is a phishing site. You should go away. So, so we're also doing this because a lot of phishing protection that have been deployed historically for large companies have been centralized. Uh, and right. this is a decentralized approach. And, and we talked about centralization versus these. So this is a decentralized database that lives on each of the client, um, similar to an endpoint antivirus, but it's updated in real time and, and distributed between the clients. Uh, and let me ask the, oh, go ahead. Yes. No, oh. no, 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 okay. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, you know, fundamentally when you're getting into decentralized security versus centralized, what are those key advantages? Are there any disadvantages? Or, um, yeah, if, if uh, maybe, Thomas, if you can break that down for us. Um, yes, the, there is disadvantage. I mean, the consensus mechanism that, that governs most blockchains, is that really needed in all the cases? In, in our decentralized password manager, we are running on top of that. Um, but, I mean, there is new decentralized models which doesn't have to imply blockchain. Uh, for instance, there is something called IPFS, which is interplanetary file system, which we might be switching over. And, and there is also like sharding and clustering. All, all the old peer-to-peer -peer networks were really decentralized. If you remember the file sharing network, they were mm -hmm. decentralized before there was a blockchain. And, and actually having that for, for a knowledge base uh, of like phishing sites, it's extremely helpful. 
to have a peer-to-peer -peer network and have a distributed network of knowledge uh, is extremely helpful. That doesn't have to imply that it's blockchain. However, um, we, we are seeing on this space that we're going through like proxy servers and centralized IT at the companies. Now everyone has to bring their own device or working from home. So, so to meet that, if you're not, you used to be only protected from phishing if you were working at the office or via the VPN, because you go through a proxy server that will protect you. But our solution is, is more modern in that way that will protect you on your end device. I don't care if it's your iPhone or your Mac or your PC, uh, whatever device you're working on, you can still like log in and, and uh, enable the FIO endpoint protection. And at the end of the day, this seems like decentralizing your security is significantly uh, harder to crack. Am I right? Um, yes. I mean, I mean, we do need decentralized security because the workforce is becoming decentralized. You don't, no one is going into the offices anymore. So, so all of these pr services and, and, and products that secure your office network is, yeah, it's not working anymore. It's like, we, we need to decentralize There's, security. Yeah. Your, your work devices have very much become your home and personal devices. I mean, Thomas and I were at RSA, the big security conference in San Francisco last week. And as, as you walk downtown, you see a lot of for rent signs. It's something like 31% occupancy right now in downtown San Francisco, where billions of dollars have been invested over the last two decades in office space. Those tens of thousands of workers are now at home and it's become increasingly more difficult to manage the security of these workers and knowing what they're doing on their work devices, what's being connected, what's not. I mean, if you can imagine your work device now being connected to the hundreds of IoT devices you're buying off of Amazon that aren't maybe the mainstream brands, that's a potential vulnerability for the organization. So how do you stay in the know and on top of your employees when you can't reach out to every one of them every day? <laughs> That is a fantastic point. You're right. We forget about that. And I guess that was sort of the last pass situation too, right? Someone the, the, that seems like the breach was someone at home, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was. They, they managed, well, first they, they breached some data system, but then they got a hold of who had VPN access. And then they hacked the, the guy that had <laughs> VPN access from home. They hacked his home network through a third party device and then jumped on the VPN tunnel into the, 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 the protected systems that only he and three other people had access to. So that's... <laughs> well, I know this is not your company, and if you don't want to comment, that's fine. But just out of curiosity, because that was such a high-profile case, and when we're talking high, uh, cybersecurity, it's hard to ignore the LastPass situation. Uh, is it fair the way people responded, or do you think that it's kind of just one of those things that happens? No. I, well, yeah, if you build your technology and you store someone else's password with a master key, then you can get hacked. Uh, were you to, to have employed like what we call like blockchain grade or asymmetric encryption, where only the end user had their own keys, uh, as in our FIO ID, our password manager, then this couldn't have happened because we wouldn't have the decryption keys. And there right. is other platforms, and that's why we use Signal to communicate with, because we know it's end-to-end -end encryption and no one else has my key. Um, so, so, I mean, there is solutions. Was this preventable? Yes, but, but with a centralized technology, no. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's a great point. Let's jump into uh, some of the broader, you know, from that area, the implications of what we're facing with cybersecurity at this point, because it seems like it's going to be a real battle on many levels. Uh, we've got, you know, obviously we talked a little bit about deep fakes, um, seeing the sophistication of that. And then we have uh, quantum computing. Um, Brian, any, any thoughts on that side and how FIO is prepping for that uh, tidal wave of security threats? I'm going to defer to Thomas on that one since he's actually worked on quantum <laughs> encryption. I feel like I'm trying to get you guys to uh, yeah. throw you the, the hard balls here. I'll ask Thomas all the marketing I have, questions. I have yeah. a reputation issue if I start talking quantum computing because Thomas, when we were in San Francisco after a couple drinks, spent 30 minutes explaining quantum encryption to me. So he he knows the talking points now. That's a good um, point. No, I think it's no. your Denver, uh, you know, wooden back. I feel like you're so hidden that you're, you're like the ultimate. Anyway, <laughs> Thomas, let's talk quantum. So, yeah, when we talk quantum and, and, and there's no, no such thing as quantum encryption, really, but there is post-quantum encryption. Um, there is a lot of research going into post-quantum encryption. 
Uh, and, and I mean, we know quantum computers are real and we know that there is, when we reach qubits of, of roughly 100, uh, basically the, the traditional encryption is based on factoring primes and they're super fast at doing that. Um, so quantum computers will eventually break all existing keys. Uh, uh, we're currently breaking, uh, I think, up to 128 bit or 40 bit is just already blown off the the of the surface uh, and and we are starting to to have maybe computers in state sponsored actors that are breaking uh, older ssl uh, stuff um so, so it's definitely happening and what what needs to happen is that we need newer encryption standards that are proven to be secure uh, and there is a lot of research in, in the research community at universities there is a lot of People in Darmstadt in Germany, there's some universe in the US that have come a far way. Um, there is ways to do this, but it's extremely heavy. The keys, I mean, the, the, the EDDSA keys that we have are like 40 characters long. They're super short on the blockchain now, um, but they're well enough to protect you. If we're going to go into deploying post quantum proof, the, the, the keys are like 1K long. So we're going from like 40 characters. Wow about 400 characters. Uh, so it's like they're 10 times as long. Uh, and that's costing money as well, of course, because so so yeah, post quantum is something to look out for. And I mean, all the intelligence organizations are looking out for this and they are implementing like it always starts military and they are going to start implementing really high secure ciphers with super long keys. The problem is, how do you transfer those keys? And then you come to the asymmetric keys. And it's possible today, mathematically proven, to, to do post-quantum encryption. But but we're not just there yet that you start, like, well, on the blockchain, it will be easy because then so, someone can actually crack the key. They can just transfer the money out. So we will know when someone have a quantum computer good enough to crack Bitcoin keys. Yeah, then it's time to upgrade the network because then someone <laughs> You just move all, right. the, all the coins to their account, which would be fun. What are the biggest misconceptions right now when people, uh, when you talk uh, on the quantum side of cybersecurity? What are people not understanding right now? Um, th there is one thing which is called quantum key distribution, distribution, KDF, which has a lot of hype. And there's a lot of research, both military and civilian, in both Europe. US and China going into this and build some sort of network to to because it comes down to the Copenhagen model that that if two atoms are spinning in the same spin state, they actually they they get entangled. So you can actually take a photon and split it in two. And if you measure one, the state comes out of the other. Um, so, so there is a lot of people doing KDF now, uh, which is like secure key distribution of quantum keys. And there's two two ways to look at this, and it comes down to the Copenhagen problem. Do you think that it magically doesn't get a state until you measure it? That that's Heisenberg. That that's the the generally accepted model. Or do you think it is that you have one left shoe and one right shoe, and if you measure that one is the left shoe, the other must be the right shoe? Um, and if that's true, I mean, yeah, th then the KDF distribution is fairly worthless. So people are maybe putting in a ton of research money in something that if you don't have a really good novel understanding of the Copenhagen model, it might just be that it's worthless. And that could be an 11 figure sunk cost. <laughs> Yeah, and that's wow. interesting. There's a lot of people that, that I know from, from the intelligence community that are debating this, like, why are we throwing money at this? And, and, and But there is a lot of politicians and grants and they don't understand quantum. Uh, and, and who am I to argue if I'm on a political level of, of giving grant money through DARPA for this? It's like, hell, it might work. No, I was going to say, it's just that that must be one of the most frustrating things when you understand these technologies at such a granular level, and then you're dealing with any of the regulatory hoops and things like that and trying to get uh, your your political layperson to understand and catch up to the size and scale of, of various threats or where to deploy resources. Well, I mean, that's a whole rabbit it's hole. It's the modern day space race. Yeah, that's a great way you know, of looking it's, at it. It's, 
Yeah, hundred percent is um, you know what was happening between like the space race between Russia and the U.S. Now it's just a few more countries added in, and it's a race for the most sophisticated AI, most sophisticated encryption. Because whoever gets there first, well, we can imagine. Let me ask this: is is the majority of the cybersecurity head to head concerns and and for an average user and then for an enterprise user? Is it really the state actors that uh, take up the majority of of your uh, you know thought process and strategies, mm. or is it still your sort of run of the mill teen from their bedroom who's trying to just get into mom's account or you know like what what's the balance between these two? Because I mean I think you're right there is an epic size uh, geopolitical component here. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the ones that cause the damage are the in-betweens. The, the, the kids in the bedroom, they don't do very much damage. And the nation state actors, they're too good. They don't want to be seen, so they don't do any damage. Even if they were to hack you, you wouldn't know. <laughs> if a Chinese hacker wow. broke into your computer, you wouldn't know. Uh, but, but what you would know is the ransomware gangs and, and the phishing sites, because that's when your account is or your computer is locked and you can't get your data. So, I mean... And, and those have actually become like a commoditized, there is like ransomware as a service. They're building ecosystems of like cyber criminals. They're working the referral networks. They, they You buy the, the zero day from someone, you buy the phishing domains from someone. They're working together in a quite organized way. And, and these like uh, cyber crime gangs are the ones that caused like 80% of the damage, I would say. Yeah. Wow. And they have great customer service. I'm not <laughs> sure if you're, I, I swear, like you get ransomed, you'll get a hotline call, you'll get tutorial videos of how to go buy your Bitcoin, how to create a Coinbase account, oh and how God. to transfer that money. There's like a whole Q&A forum. I mean, they're, they're you get loyalty rewards programs if you keep getting hacked enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah. How do you think I got 10 cents off a gallon of yeah. gas? <laughs> Do the state actors ever collaborate at that criminal level, or is that just like too uh, low level for what we're seeing at the at the you know more sophisticated points? I mean, we we do have state sponsored actors that are uh, being paid through crypto walls. There there were some research recently that I read, and and yes, the the there is nation state. Uh, mo mostly Russia and China that are actually paying ransomware gangs and other people to target various political reasons as well. Uh, so there is affiliation between these cyber criminals and nation states. Uh, and also they have been deploying zero day malware through these gangs, uh, but the, to hide that it's a nation state attack. So basically you give here, you have a magic cookie. If you deploy this to the US, that'd be nice. Uh, so, 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 I mean, we have seen traces of, of actually using existing ransomware to deploy novel zero-day code that is probably in nation states. And are we generally able to accurately predict where uh, a threat or a phishing attack comes from? Is that is that at this point pretty easy to identify or can people cloak themselves through enough different channels that you're kind of making a best guess more or less? I mean, I, I would say attribution game is, is we actually thought about doing an attribution dice, which you give out at RSA, because some of the attribution reports that I read, it's like, oh, it's Russians because the time clock of this machine was, and, and there were Cyrillic characters in the code. And it's like, so if you read behind the lines, the attribution data that most people have uh, are really weak. They, they, they normally don't leave very many traces. And, and I mean, most of the American vendors that do antivirus like to do attribution because it, the attribution game will give you big headlines. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you succeedingly attributed an attack to, to a nation state actor, it will give you big headlines. So most of the attribution reports that actually come through and read through, I would question them highly. It's, I, I would say like it's between 50 and 80% secure. Wow. There's no like call for comment. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, unless, I don't know. They I have mean, the customer like, service. Yeah, so it just statement. seems like yeah. you call the uh, press well, I mean, department. Yeah. The ransomware gangs are pretty easy because they yeah. all speak, they, they, they all speak in Cyrillic. Yeah. It's like they, they might not be Russian, but they're from some other Stone country. And we, we call them the Stones, like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, some, some affiliated country. Uh, where you speak with Cyrillic characters, eight percent. So, so we've sufficiently terrified everyone about cybersecurity. Now, uh, maybe we can discuss a little bit about uh, FIO. Uh, dive into FIO agent. 
And, uh, you know, what kinds of tools are you putting into place uh, that do protect users? Obviously, you have a, a number of features, real-time alerts, uh, you know, DI portal management, self-service, and so on through your app. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to ask Brian or Thomas, but I think whoever feels most equipped to walk us through a little bit of those features from a consumer side. Yeah, Brian. Go sure. Ahead. All right. So, um, I mean, we'll start with the, our, our business case. What we found talking with a number of organizations with our background in Web3 and then also a lot of SMBs is they really don't know where to start when it comes to like continuous protection beyond just the basic things like get people on 2FA. Uh, you know, put in Cloudflare and all their other buzzwords that they see on their security checklist, they don't really know what comes next. So biodomain intelligence is our automated threat intelligence portal. It's you create an account. Uh, if you're like the head of IT or whoever's handling security for the organization, create an account, you add your domains, you add your executives, um, you know, your locations, your organization. And really what we're doing from there is we're, creating real-time detections around potential threats. So one of the biggest ones that relates to phishing is sim similar domains. So if it was FIO with a zero dot IO, uh, you know, we would detect that as a similar domain. Somebody might be trying to spoof us or fish us. And, you know, I'm, I'm in, from my e-commerce days, I'm in a lot of Shopify groups and I see that's a big problem, especially with these e-commerce sites is people are, as Thomas calls it, like copy pasta, like the website, uh, they run an ad campaign like buy, uh, you know, this awesome new pair of Lululemon shorts at a discount. And, you know, it's they're getting the credit cards. So how do you protect against that? So our portal will pick up all these newly registered domains and match them against what your actual domain is and alert you via an incident like this is a potential phishing domain. Uh, you should investigate this and then we can take down the website for our our clients. The second is around leak credentials. Um, <laughs> the most commonly leaked credential in organizations, or at least the top five, is the domain URL. So being able to alert your whoever's heading up security that like, hey, uh, Thomas, you have a leaked credential. You need to make sure you're not reusing this password and you need to change it there. Those are the types of things that we're protecting for. So it's like phishing, similar domains, darknet mentions, and we're doing all of this in real time. But the benefit for the user that may not have a background like Thomas in cryptography and cybersecurity is getting started really is just a couple of minutes. You monitor it. We have an open source intelligence analyst or OSA analyst assigned to the client and the client's able to interact and say, hey, um, should I be concerned about this or should I not? But then that scales all the way up to the enterprise that has 10,000 employees. We, we want to build a product that can scale with the user and the growth of the company. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. No, I think that's fantastic. A lot of great thought starters there. And, and in terms of the scalability, and would you say that one of the biggest components, uh, you know, when you're scraping data and trying to figure out where the threats are coming from, or say, you know, uh, sort of those invitation domain names and whatnot, that like really speed is the name of the game, that once a breach happens, the best move is you've got to move quickly, right? Like, is, there's there, is there like a certain time window once something oh, is yeah, discovered? Yeah. There is, and it's closing. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, it used to be when I started in this game many, many years ago that if someone registered a domain you, for for malware or or phishing, it used to be like thirty to sixty days before they actually started. That's using. pretty generous. Yeah, that gives you some time. Now it's like we we there see, was no Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that was before Twitter, exactly. So so now we're seeing that it, basically they register domain. They put up a certificate because there is also new services where you can get auto certificates spun up, set up a server. It's up in minutes and you see start using the thing within minutes. So it used to be most of the service provider got their like feed of newly registered domain on a daily basis. That's not enough anymore. We need to in real time fuss if someone buys a domain. So we, we constantly, for all the domains we protect, we do fussing and trying to find similar domains and see if they're resolved. And the moment they're resolved, we alert our clients. Because having a day old list of newly registered domains from yesterday, then actually we, we had that first and our clients got hacked before. So we, we need to improve. So it's definitely a, a speed game. You need to detect quickly and take down quickly. As well. And not file clients. We're talking past here. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, no, you're, you're being... <laughs> <laughs> Just want to clarify that. But yeah, I mean, Thomas gave a little bit more, uh, like, 
higher level explanation, but really it's about doing things in real time and getting notified in real time. And we, as we built out this portal, we saw what's happening with decentralized workforces. As I mentioned earlier, like you have employees all over the globe now um, that move wherever they want that fits their kind of lifestyle, but works for a company headquartered in San Francisco, New York, Boston, name any major city. So how do we protect for that? Um, and that's why we created an enterprise version of what we call file agent, which is our real-time phishing protection. Because in addition to the giving, if, as a head of IT, you don't know what you don't know. And if you can't walk over and talk to Bill next door in the next office, how do you know when a potential threat has emerged from something that Bill did? So our file agent solution on the enterprise level, if Thomas clicks a phishing link, that creates an incident in our file domain intelligence portal. So that way user is notified they clicked the phishing link and Thomas, our head of security, security knows in real time that, you know, someone clicked a phishing link and we've eliminated that time lag. Because as Thomas mentioned, it's not a day now or 30, 60 days right. before we have to come up with a resolution. We need to know in real time when something potentially threatful will happen and take action immediately. And that's well, what we built. How many people across the organization say there is one breach like that in a phishing link? How many people need to be notified? Does everyone need to be notified? Is everyone getting a constant barrage of, ah, oh, Bill clicked something again? Or is it just within the domain of, of the person who's in the immediate, uh, you know, uh, I guess, front row seat? The, secu so the security guy knows or whoever is managing like the portal right. and the organization's sec uh, security infrastructure. They're the one that knows. But Bill is then able to navigate away from the site. so. Me as a head of security, I would know if Bill went to the site or left the site. And then I could do some damage control if he went there and understand what data he potentially put in, whether it was credentials, company credit card, uh, you name it. We're, we're able to find that information in real time, which before was kind of a black box. Um, and we built this because we know if you've ever done the cybersecurity training, it's like they're always filmed in night for some reason in the 1980s. But... People take that training and they remember for about an hour. Every once in a while, they'll get a fake phishing email to test if they remembered, but people immediately forget. They have other priorities throughout the day. So we wanted to make something that was stupid simple for both the head of security at the organization and every employee to use that was completely uncomplicated, automated from start to finish. And you know, a warning came up, they click away, that's it. We don't need to mess with the whole sending, doing education. There's some other great people in the space doing that. We want to focus on if a real-time situation comes up, can an employee manage it without having to have a master's in cryptography? No, and I think that's brilliant, and that's where you stand out because I, I, I do feel like exactly what you're saying. Like So much of cybersecurity is this sort of failing attempt to try to educate average users. And the reality is we're all working, we're busy. We can't keep up with these kinds of threats. And, and like you said, a lot of people don't even really know how to enter a proper password or, or not to mention anything well, well beyond that. So as much as it operates in the background, your security pro, uh, professionals can, uh, can deal with the threat. That's a huge benefit to an organization. Um, you know, as we sort of wrap up a little bit, I want to tap into any future developments, any updates for FIO, uh, you know, you have such a big suite of tools. I, I think it's impressive how much you, from what I understand, integrate all of them. Um, but maybe uh, if you can speak to that a bit, you know, like what, uh, any new things on the horizon. Yeah. <laughs> but don't yeah. tell the hackers and, you know, just yeah, tell us. The, yeah. I mean, Say automation, it. as we said, is key. And, and we're looking to automate the process even more uh, with AI. So one of the things that we're doing a lot is domain takedown, where we present evidence to the registrar, the register the domains have taken down. We're actually experimenting with AI there, not only the AI to detect the, the phishing site, but also collect the evidence and file the reports automatically via AI to actually write up a summary. Why is this domain threatful to actually use generative AI there uh, to simplify? But so, so basically, the, the short summary is more AI will help us shorten the response time. That, that's like. So it's a, it is, it's like, a, I guess, a war of the bots, right? There's more AI on the threat side, and you have to keep ramping up your arsenal on the protection side, right? I mean, it's literally going to be AI bot generates a phishing site, AI bot detects phishing site. 
the two go to battle like some type of you know <laughs> james cameron like huge blockbuster hit right and uh us as the humans have sit there all we really did was click a button and that's really what we're <laughs> going to get to so our, our goal up bio is just to stay ahead of the game and be better than the bad actors out there no that's a i think that's a very noble pursuit and, and certainly one that's more and more vital um thank you so much both of you brian thomas for uh joining uh you know sort of one final takeaway uh is there where can people get started what are the questions they should start asking when they're thinking seriously about cybersecurity right now good Sorry. question uh, i mean l look at yourself and i think the most important thing is, is to get the, an exposure how exposed am i uh, and one way could be to download the FIO agent to see which password have I had reused um, and, and, and to actually look at what's my risk exposure already um, and, and and how am I interacting with the web. So, so I think that's the, the, the main thing uh, to actually start evaluating yourself. And I mean, the, there is uh, first our, our site where you can download the, the FIO agent that will show you this. There is also Have I Been Pwned, which is a quite famous site for, for checking breaches. So that, that's a good start. And then make sure that you have some sort of endpoint protection. Uh, because a lot of people think like, no, no, Macs, they're magical. I'm running a Mac, so I don't need that. <laughs> the <laughs> impenetrable <laughs> Mac, yes. Exactly. That's a myth. I, I, as a hacker, can say truly that is a myth. I can write malware. There is malware for Macs. They're very efficient. <laughs> but, but somehow Mac users think that they're invulnerable. Which is no, it's a great yeah. takeaway. So, I mean, for me, that I mean, that's very the technical. I would say go to fyeo.io, bio.io, uh, download our, our some of our free tools, and if you're a business, get in touch to, and we can show you really what we can do. But I would say for everybody out there, we we run at incredible speed these days with multitasking. We have a thousand apps open. We're very we've become a culture of like I need to click. It's a FOMO culture that we've created, especially when it comes to the Web3 games. So the number one thing before you download any tool or on top of it is take a pause. When you get an email, when you get a text, don't just click. When you get a text that says, hey, your bank account has been breached, don't click right away. Take a second. Is the URL real? Do you know who the sender is? And just pause. Because those 10 seconds can be the difference between you losing your identity, your crypto, your finances or staying safe. Fantastic. Haunting, but very important words. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you. Bye.